Grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, as you know, Ash Wednesday means we're here at the beginning of our Lenten journey, and it's a journey toward the gates of Jerusalem. It's a journey toward the upper room. It's a journey toward Gethsemane. It's a journey toward the cross and toward the empty tomb. And during this journey, we're looking at Psalms of Lament in our sermon series. We're calling it Teach Us to Pray. And the title of this series comes from a question that Jesus' disciples asked him when he was on a journey that's actually a lot like the one that we're on during Lent. It's a journey to Jerusalem. And it's recorded in Luke chapter 11. This is verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus then proceeds to give him the Lord's Prayer. And he says this, <clears throat> when you pray, say, and then he goes into the words that they should use to address God. And that seems like kind of a strange thing for many of us, to be given words to say when we pray. I mean, many of us, myself included, we like the personal nature of our relationship with God, and that means to being able to be pretty informal when you pray, pretty informal when you address God. It means being able to speak from the heart. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a very good thing to be able to speak from the heart. In fact, I think one of the most heartfelt prayers in the Bible, at least I, I consider it to be a prayer, is when in Mark 9, this father who is exhausted and, and who has this child who's been possessed by demons his whole life, this father speaks to Jesus and says to Jesus, if you can do anything, help him. And the text says he's tried everything to help his son. And when Jesus says that all things are possible to him who believes, the, the father immediately breaks out and you can almost hear the desperation in his voice. When he says, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. That's a heartfelt prayer. And it's a heartfelt prayer that comes from the ragged edge of life. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing to pray from the heart. But there are times when we find ourselves on the ragged edge of life and prayer is not so easy. The will isn't there. The words don't come. There are times when things are so dark and desperate, so hard and so heartbreaking, that when we go to pray, we don't know what to do and we don't know how to do it. We don't know what to say. There are times when things have fallen so far apart in our lives that we stand speechless before our God. Ash Wednesday reminds us of our mortality. This morning I did in position of ashes here at the school during school chapel, and our students walked up, and some of them walked up again tonight. They walked up one by one, and they were the same students that I had greeted in the morning at Carline, the same students that I'd smiled at. Really, it was just moments before they came in for chapel as they climbed out of their cars and they went into class for the day. And I put the sign of the cross on the forehead in ashes kids that are full of life. And we remind them of their own mortality on days like today. And you know why we do that? Because it doesn't just remind us of our mortality, it reminds us of our need for Jesus. One thing it reminds us of is that we're sinful. You know, sin is an ugly thing. That's why we use ash, that's why we use the, the dark stuff on our foreheads. Sin is an ugly thing. It's not just ugly, but it's destructive. It destroys all kinds of stuff. You probably know this about sin in your own life. It destroys relationships. It destroys households. It destroys churches. It destroys all kinds of things around us. Sin has brought people to ruin. It has brought companies to bankruptcy. It has brought countries to recession. Sin literally ruined the world. Sin destroys hearts. Sin killed Jesus. That's what put him on the cross. And one of the times we might find ourselves pretty speechless before God is when we come face to face with our own sin, with the depth of our wrongdoing. When the consequences of that sin come flooding into our lives and everything comes crashing down, we may find ourselves pretty speechless before our God. Maybe that isn't happening for you this Ash Wednesday. And if you're not there, all the more reason to do the ashes to remind ourselves that our sin never goes away, that our sin is destructive and deadly, and it's still there. It's still in our hearts, still just inches away from destroying our lives. 
And maybe you are there this Ash Wednesday. Maybe you're mourning over, over whatever your sin has ruined in your life. Your reputation, or a relationship, or your standing, or your career, or your home, or your friends, or your family. Maybe it hits home to you today that that ash on your forehead means the wages of sin is death. In fact, maybe all that really needs to hit home for any of us is the eternal consequence of our sin. And when that happens, when that really sinks in, you may find yourself speechless before a holy God as you look at your own sin. And that's why today we look at Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a lament psalm, and that's what we're going to be looking at in, these midweek, uh, in our midweek services, the psalms of lament. And lament psalms are, are psalms that are there to give us words to cry out to our God when we don't have any. That's what Psalm 51 is. But it's also the prayer of an adulterer. And it's also the prayer of a murderer. It's also the prayer of a man who used his power and his position to treat people like property and take whatever he wanted with absolutely no thought of the consequences or who he would hurt. In other words, it's a psalm of David. It's a psalm of David and it's written by David when all that stuff I just said came crashing down in his life. When Nathan called him out about his adultery with Bathsheba and then his murdering of her husband. This is the prayer of a man who stands accused and helpless before a holy God. Oh, so when that's where, where we are, when that's where we find ourselves, we turn to Psalm 51. And if we find ourselves speechless before our God because of our own sin, these words of David carry us. They carry us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. That's David's prayer. And it's our prayer this Ash Wednesday. And God answers that prayer with Jesus. You know, when Nathan calls David out on his sin and David recognizes what he's done, he is absolutely crushed. And immediately he says, I have sinned against God. And right after he says that, Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin. In other words, God forgives you. He proclaims the absolution. He answers with the gospel because David's adultery with Bathsheba, David's murder of her husband Uriah, all the stuff that he confesses in Psalm 51, Jesus would carry that to the cross. He carried to the cross and he died for it. When we recognize our own sin, when we are crushed, when we are speechless before our God because we're surrounded by the ruin that our sin has caused and we know we are to blame, then we take up the words of this murderer. We take up the words of David the adulterer. We take up the words that the Holy Spirit placed in the Bible for us so that those words would carry us, carry us when we have nothing to say, and that those words would carry us back to the grace of God, back to the cross, back to the empty tomb. They would carry us to a love of a God that would not stop at anything to make sure that we would live. Even though the wages of sin is death, they carry us to a love of, of a God who, who makes sure that the ashes that are on your forehead and on your hand aren't the last word in your life. The words of Psalm 51 carry us to forgiveness and life with Christ. The point about prayer tonight for us is that biblically we find out that prayer can be taught, prayer can be learned. If you're not sure what to do when you pray, if you're not sure what words to say, if it feels like you're, you're talking to yourself, then come with us into Scripture this Lent. Come with us and ask with the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray from Luke 11. Now remember in that story what Jesus says. He says, when you pray, say this. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, you know, you really ought to know this already. I mean, at this point, remember, these guys have been following Jesus for about three years now. This is Luke chapter 11. He is on his way to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem to die. 
It's right toward the end of his earthly life and ministry. He's already sent out the 12 disciples in Luke chapter 9. He's already sent out the 72 in Luke chapter 10. And he gets this question, teach us to pray. You'd think they'd already know how to pray if they'd been following Jesus around, but Jesus doesn't rebuke them. Jesus doesn't send them away. And he also doesn't say, just speak from the heart, even though that's okay too. No, he teaches. He says, when you pray, say this, our Father. He gives them words when they don't have any. He gives them words to approach their God, to approach the one ear that hears. The end of our opening hymn, when all things seem against us to drive us to despair, one, we know one gate is open, one ear will hear our prayer. The words that Jesus gives go to that ear. And sometimes in darkness, Sometimes in darkness we need those words. Sometimes in darkness we need the words of the church to carry us. Even when it's not the darkness of our own sin, even when it's darkness that happens to us, the words of the church carry us and they give us words when we don't have any. It was on the night of April 10th, I'm sorry, April 20th, 2010, when an offshore oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico called the Deepwater Horizon had what's called a blowout. And so seawater and mud and methane gas erupted out of the oil rig and it caught fire. And what followed was a series of explosions and fire and chaos that could have very, very easily killed every single person on board. And after hours of fighting for their life through fire and destruction and explosions and poisonous gas and chaos in the middle of the dark, deep, and uncaring ocean. Most of the crew was rescued by a nearby ship called the Bankston. Eleven crew members died on Deepwater Horizon that night. And according to an article in the New York Times, here's what happens next. Quote, The next morning was clear and calm. The horizon receding in the distance burned brightly. The crew gathered on Bankston's deck, Shoulder to shoulder, they, turned, uh, they formed a large circle, and a BP manager explained that they were headed back to Louisiana. Mr. Linder, a former in- English teacher, interrupted. We should really say something for our fallen, he said. The group fell silent. Patrick Morgan, an assistant driller, spoke up first. Our father, is what he said. And when he said those words, hard hats came off. Knees were bowed, and the surviving crew of Deepwater Horizon continued with, Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The words of the church carried them. The prayer of our Lord carried them. It gave them words when they didn't have any other words to say, when all other words failed them. And if you are in that place, if you are adrift in a deep, dark and uncaring ocean, when your heart falls silent and your words fail, you simply say what Jesus said. You let the words of the church carry you. Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus.